This word in your ear is brought to you thanks to NordVPN, and VPN stands for, Mark? Virtual Private Network. Say it it again. Say it again. It's Virtual Private Network. That's absolutely correct. And it's a way to keep your data safe on the internet whenever you're logging in, either at home or abroad. It protects your identity and encrypts your data so that nobody can steal that identity. And at the same time, there's a fun part. It enables you to access the internet via servers in more than 50, count of 50, different countries. This means you can often sidestep region restrictions and stream movies and TV programs from all over the world. And so, you know, this week I've been doing the usual thing of going through Swedish Netflix and catching up on old Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers films from the from the oh, 1960s. Oh, lovely! Which ones? Which you can never have too much too much of. Actually, a personal favourite of mine is Only Two Can Play. Oh, I which, don't know that. Which is based on a Kingsley Amos story, and um, Peter Sellers plays an ambitious Welsh librarian who's <laughs> uh, uh, and the uh, the the little town that is rather upset by the arrival of Swedish sex bomb Mai Zetterling. You remember in those days. You know, if you wanted to have a sex bomb, a sex bomb always had to come from overseas. Because yeah. they overseas they, knew, overseas they knew about sex, didn't they? You know, That's France, right. Sweden, or whatever. And, but in the 60s, you just had to say the word Swedish and people would just start to shiver with excitement. You know? <laughs> Really, anyway, really, the, 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 the British were just fantastically repressed, weren't they? It was a carry-on concept, really. Yeah. Anyway, it's a wonderful film. It's got Kenneth Griffith in it as well. It's, I cannot recommend it too highly. Anyway, uh, you can take advantage of a deal where you can try NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com slash your ear or just use the code your ear to get a huge discount of your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free and a bonus gift. And it's risk-free because there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Full details in the show notes. <laughs> You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Well, major and very, very sad news the other day about Jeff Beck, which made us both think immediately of our old pal, Kate Mossman, who we were at uh, Word magazine with, and uh, uh, and who we imagine was probably sitting in a ring of candles, um, weeping possibly and listening to Beck's Bolero, because she is such a huge admirer and has written a fantastic piece about him, which has just been republished in the New States. We'll, we'll get on to that in a moment. But, but Kate, you, you discovered... Jeff, I think when we were at Word, didn't you? I yeah. Mean, was that right? Is that when you first came across him? Well, he was, well because he, he was somebody who uh, kind of pushed himself um, creatively throughout yeah. his life. He sort of had his critical high point in about 2009 when he played Ronnie Scott's for Seven Nights with Pal Wilkenfeld and Vinnie Coelita and people out. And they made this really great DVD and it's a very kind of polished, beautiful performance. And you could see people like, I think you could see Clapton in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's where, I mean, I knew all about, I knew of him, um, but I didn't know what he was really until I saw that. And then I got obsessed with it and I gave it to my dad, who had sort of parted ways with Beck around the kind of Yardbirds period and got into Clapton and then knew that Beck was still playing, but didn't really didn't didn't know, really what, he know what he was doing. No. Well, he was I mean, doing he was amazing doing... versions of A Day in the Life, wasn't he? By the yeah, Beatles yeah, and yeah. things like that. Extraordinary stuff. Yeah. So it was it was very much it was very exciting to discover that he he was doing so many different uh, equally strange things in in one night basically on Ronnie Scott's stage I never saw the actual gig um but then we started a tradition of going to see him uh, probably every year because he was always playing yeah um, he always had different um uh lady musicians in his band um oh, was, did, was it lady musicians was that his um he was yeah, like speciality one. He always had one lady musician that he mentored um, and they were like extremely good, accomplished musicians. And then sometimes they were also very attractive. So (laughs) (laughs) the stage had a certain look that was kind of maybe one step up from the usual um, sort of, you know, graying 
spraying rock bands. Yes, so it's, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're probably not so many men in baseball caps as they would normally be the case with. Because Mark yeah. and I, we're, we're talking about uh, Jeff Beck this morning, and one of the things about Jeff Beck, you know, apart from the kind of extraordinary musical standard he kept up throughout his career, was that he basically looked the same in his 70s he, as he, he never looked changed. in his Late teens. He was effectively had exactly the same hair, which he managed to maintain the same colour, yeah. and, and wore pretty much the same clothes. And I'm assuming that the hair was was nylon and was kind of woven in. The scalp <laughs> it might have it might have had some uh, what do you call it volume added. That's yeah. right. But I mean, it was and, and obviously it was a peculiar colour. But you know, he still broadly looked exactly same, a kind of Nigel Tufnell blueprint, yeah. print, which he must have been, must he? I think, he was, you know. he was definitely. Yeah. Um, the, the clothes were were amazing. They were kind of um, white satin, uh, skin tight leggings with boxing boots, kind of yeah. tied up to the mid calf, and then yeah. um, always sleeveless, so you could see his muscular little whammy bar style arms. Yeah, and then yeah, when yeah. I interviewed him, I, I, I sort of mentioned his stage wear, and he just said like. Yeah, the stage wear's got to go. <laughs> he was still doing it. And apparently it was made by the uh, the woman who made the costumes for Downton Abbey. So he really? had, you know, he had good connections and he had people yeah. especially making these suits for him. But um yeah. they were slightly he just looked like an athlete or something, a strange kind of sportsman. Yeah, something. he used to wear singlets, didn't he? Look very muscular. Yeah. As if yeah. he'd just come back from a gym or something, you know. Yeah. And I think Harvey Goldsmith was his manager um for quite a long time. And I kind of felt a bit of that sort of eighties um queen on stage you know the kind of the adidas boxing boots and it's things that made you very agile you could leap around quite a lot and stuff so you really did look like a, the archetypal rock star but, but wasn't. looking at the or reading the the kind of tributes it, it, there's a lot of people saying oh this is the best guitarist or whatever as if as if that competition is still going on mm. it started in the melanie maker in about 1965 as if anybody cares who was the best or whatever yeah clapton but, is god <laughs> whatever uh, but but it's probably true to say that he was the guitarist guitarist isn't, isn't mm. that true to say you know that 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 He's the one that other guitarists tended to look up to. Yeah, I think the sheer the, the range and the the fact that what he it's very hard to describe what he's doing a lot of the time. There's one um, song called "Where Were You," which he wrote in the late eighties, which I did figure out what he was doing. I've sort of forgotten, but he's basically using the whammy bar to play to play a tune. So he'd kind of prise it right off the the body and then wiggle it about. So it almost sounded like a theremin or something. Oh, really? um, and then he said, he said something like, oh, people, people say it's not proper playing, but you try it kind of thing. That was his attitude. Everything was kind of a joke and stuff. But he, he would do very unusual things that you kind of felt were the product of just hours and hours of tinkering away. Yes. Um, and, and funny things with a bottleneck as well. He'd like tap the, the frets very lightly with a bottleneck and you'd hear almost like these little explosions going off rather than using it just as a slide of well, weird things that he was up to. So I think maybe he was that's really he obsessive mean. about guitars, wasn't he? There's yeah. a lovely bit in your piece in the New Statesman where, um, and you forget that the, the electric guitar at that time when he was young was, was a completely new thing. I mean, it was okay. quite hard to actually go and see one, you know, Absolutely. and there's a lovely story, wasn't there, where a mate of his, uh, he crosses town to go and look at somebody's catalogue. Is that right? Yeah. The and the guy go- brings it down to the end of the garden and lets That's him look right. at it over the gate and says, don't dog ear it. You know, he yeah, not allowed really to touch it. Just when look the f- at the catalogue of guitars. The, yeah. first, the first Fender Stratocaster in the UK was bought by Cliff Richard for Hank Marvin and was ordered from the United States and Amazing. was such, such an object of veneration that... Hank used to take it into town and let people know where he was going to be, and they would come to come. look at it. And to, just look, to look yeah. at it. Yeah. And, you know, because don't forget, these things were called Stratocasters, Telecasters, whatever, to indicate that they were from the future. Mm. They were, you know, yeah. they, they, they didn't bear any relation to the pre war world. You know what I mean? So Jeff was part of that generation. He was. Uh, yeah. you know, people, people like Hank were slightly ahead, but only because Hank started younger, really. Probably not much difference in age, you know. And it's no uh, wonder that the Guitar God idea came out when it was about a new thing, a new implement that people didn't have. And let's see what you can do with it effectively. And they there was this little sort of period of time where they were all trying to show that they could do different things and I remember him saying that when Hendrix came along he stopped 
being able to do certain tricks. I think maybe with reverb and things like that, he gave up on that and went down another route because he could see that Hendrix was doing that particular thing better. So, yeah. and Clapton was a blues purist. So Beck became like a, a, a trickster kind of thing. And it's like everyone sort of tried to find their role. Um, yes, they, they were kind of like stage acts, weren't they? That you'd go and see somebody and you think, he's got a stage act that's completely outranked me. I might as well give up. Well, you see, yeah. they that, always that, talk about when, when Hendrix arrived. They were kind of like, long that's went the home. Point. There's two things, two things I want to mention while we're doing this. Yeah, while we're talking about this, this uh, very important field, actually. One is Clapton is God was completely invented by a guy called Hamish Grimes, who worked for Giorgio Gamelsky, who just had the idea of writing the words Clapton is God on a wall, taking a photograph of it, and, and then saying, Look ever at this. since then... People have still been saying kids were writing Clapton is God. Oh, no, yeah. And they yeah, never yeah. did. They never did. It was just Hamish Grimes who did that. And the other thing was that when Charles Chandler found Jimi Hendrix in Greenwich Village, the only place in the world where he could launch him was in London. Yeah. Was to take yeah. him to London. And what <laughs> you did is you put him in the Scotch St. James one night and you'd be out front, you would have Jeff Beck. Eric Clapton, Pete Townsend, Pete Townsend, yeah, yeah. Peter Green, I don't know who, Jimmy Page, and uh, you know that, that was Gunslinger Central, wasn't it? You know, mm. that, and it's the it's the idea the idea of the guitar hero is such a curious idea. There was mm. never a piano hero, was there? Never a drum I, hero. No, yeah. and I don't think that, that that it'll happen again because I just don't think instrumental players could be elevated to celebrity status in the same way as they were when the guitar was new. And that was why it was, it had I that suppose kind of so. I suppose And also so. it was portable. The, you know, you could yeah. use it as, it was a piece of theatre. You could go all over the stage and do things with it, which you couldn't do with a piano or drums, really. Yeah. Mm. The, but he was, he was, um, he had a problem with groups, didn't he, really? The, the, mm. You know, because he started Je the Jeff Beck group in 67, 68 or whatever. Rod Stewart, singer. <laughs> You know, Mickey Waller, Ron Wood on the bass. And they made this fantastic first album called Truth, produced by Mickey Most, which has got shapes of thing, things on it, and I ain't superstitious. And I'm sorry, it's Led Zeppelin. <laughs> it's Led <laughs> Zeppelin six months before Led Zeppelin. Which is partly why he was so hacked off when Led Zeppelin had all that success. <laughs> he, was really, he was really eaten up with envy, wasn't he? Well, except by then, he'd walked away from it pretty much. Yeah. You know, he, no, because didn't he leave the Jeff Beck group about two weeks before Woodstock or something? Yeah, when they... how can you yeah. leave a group called the Jeff Beck group if you're Jeff Beck? <laughs> if you're Jeff Beck. Um, and they're about to play Woodstock. So he just couldn't. I mean, you know, there's that thing in your piece where you talk about, is it self-sabotage? Is it just incompetence? Is it him being an underachiever? But you get the feeling that actually he, he really didn't want that kind of no, he didn't. attention. Yeah. He's did like he? those people that can't can't do an office job, you know, because they need to work yeah. for themselves. Like there's, it's just a personality type, isn't it? And I think he's probably yeah. very difficult. I think that there were lots of temper tantrums and stuff like when he was in his... Um, the earlier part of his career, and then you feel that he just carved out this this uh, little world where he sort of almost he, he had this kind of ridiculous appearance, and he was very funny and all that kind of thing. And so he was kind of protected by this kind of cartoon rock star exterior, and then yeah. underneath it, he was just allowed to to tinker and to get better and better and better. And I think he still practiced several hours a day, even in his seventies. Oh, really, oh, really? Quite unusual. Um, that maybe is he amazing. Would just, yeah, you never you're never quite sure whether what he said was true or not because there was kind of a boomtish line for every single yeah, part of his career. Yeah, boomtish, <laughs> boomtish line. That's very true. I, I tell you the thing that fascinated me that I saw in the obituaries that he was married at nineteen. Wasn't yeah, he? and he just... had a huge Afghan hound, and he could barely afford the dog food. And his first <laughs> that's right. That's and then right. Um, yeah, he had six wives, like Henry the Eighth. Was it really uh, six? Yeah, six. But no, no kids. No. Well, uh, no, not. I mean, maybe. Well, they're, they're, no, no, absolutely. And that's the strange thing to me about the 19-year-old, you know, getting married at 19. People got married at 19 in the 60s because they yeah. had to. Because they had to. They were, yeah. they, were, they were Brian Jones or something. They just, yeah. you know, they, were, they, they did, had thousands of children, you know. Mm. But I love the idea that he, because, you know, he was with uh, Celia Hammond. Yes. Yeah. And so she she then, they, they basically, basically, I think, I'm right in thinking, they both live in, lived in the same town right through their whole lives. She had 
a load of animal sanctuaries. He had an animal sanctuary in Tunbridge Wells. They still saw each other, like on the street in Wadhurst. It's still a street, that is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Exactly. It is. Somewhere the 60s are still going on, you know, in, <laughs> in, in tiny places in, in, in Sussex. And because also there's, there's the, the, uh, the thing I was playing yesterday was the, uh, you know, the, the records Blow by Blow and uh, what's the one after it called Wired, I think. Um, mm. And, you know, these are these two records he made with George Martin in the mid 70s, which were yeah. enormous hits, weren't they? they were instrumental records, effectively, you know. Yeah, I think those were his turning points. So playing with George Martin and also. Um, touring with the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Those were the two moments after the whole kind of will you join the Stones or not period where he thought, I've found myself musically. And he felt he, that, thought, he thought the Stones were too dumb, really, for it. He him. said they weren't playing. <laughs> but that was, so tell, tell us the story. It's brilliant of, of when he went for his kind of, I suppose, his interview. Tell us what it's, happened. It was very it's funny. brilliant. I've got to find the quote. Um, so... <laughs> He said in the piece, in the mid 1970s, he was flown to Rotterdam to discuss the possibility of joining the Stones. Quote, I'd been there two days and I hadn't seen a stone. And I thought, <laughs> right, I'm witnessing what it's like to be a stone, not playing and having single malt whiskies. Yeah, it's, it's true. But it's doesn't true. he try and go and say goodbye to Keith Richards? Keith Richards, he can't even wake him up. He's just and eventually just puts a little note under his door saying, you know, I'm off, you know. And He's got some particular old blues record playing on a little dance set thing next to going round bed, and round. Keith Richards yeah. and I think Beck apparently lifted the the needle up and stopped the record playing and left a note and then went back to I mean the whole thing is probably completely fabricated but it was yeah I think that and then he kind of came he came back to London and and he became much more interested in jazz and when he was working with um uh George Martin he said he, he felt like he was flying to be like he felt he just wanted to impress George Martin every day and that was his kind of reason for going into work and that's when he kind of found himself um so. but also a lot of the the success of hi ho silver lining had a real effect on him didn't it because i mean it's funny we were talking about david I talked about that earlier, because when we we're old enough to remember that when you went to a party around then you know late 60s or whatever that was the song that ended Absolutely. the party that was your last chance to Absolutely. dance with that earlier. and it was and everyone be there with a can of you know wit bread and punch in the air and, you know, it was the singer. dancing queen of its day it was it a brilliant party. song it was the final song that's amazing of course it was. yeah oh, really? and it had that yeah. double tracked solo that everyone sang along to and he hated brilliant. it he hated it because what did he, he say to you that he, he obviously like, didn't like his voice did he you know because that's what a rare yeah. case is where yeah, he, he sang sing. right yeah, yeah, but he, he kind of all right. He likened it to having a pink toilet seat hung round his neck for the rest of his life. That's right, like kind of a laughing stock. <laughs> I was in all the kind of radio uh, obits and tributes uh, the, the other day. They kept get, giving the impression that was just a terrible song. It's not. No, it's not. It's a brilliant song. song. I don't, but also, <laughs> he didn't. Song. He didn't write it. So didn't he? I don't know if it's in your piece, but it's something somewhere I read. He says I got forty quid for it or something. Oh like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Which is probably yeah. true because he didn't write it. But it's also produced again by Mickey Most. And it's like mm. all all the people produced by Mickey Most, Donovan, the animals, yeah. Jeff Beck, they all they all say, Oh, I hated that. I hated that. But Mickey Most knew what a hit record was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Far yes, better than where, they where did. might he be without it? Who knows? Uh, absolutely. Where he might be yeah. it. Absolutely. It made him famous. And of course, you know. He stayed famous for a long, long time, didn't mm. he? <laughs> you know? I think the thing I find very sad is that, you know, when I go and see these guys like Matheny and John McLaughlin and stuff, I'm always obsessively looking at their hands to see if they're starting to kind of get arthritic and harden up and can they do yeah. this? And he wasn't at that stage at all. As far as I remember, he was still very agile and he died of something that was completely ridiculous. It's like, a meningitis, wasn't meningitis. it? Meningitis. Yeah, a sudden yeah. meningitis. I mean, I don't know terrible. how that would have happened, but no. he would have actually probably had another five years at least of... <laughs> well, because he'd just, yeah. he'd just been touring, hadn't he? he yeah. He had, a, he'd had a very high-profile tour, indeed. Oh, what, the one yeah. Johnny Depp? Because of Johnny, of Johnny Depp. Depp. See, that, that, Dave and I have talked about this. We're trying to imagine what it would be like if you were a hardcore 
um, Jeff Beck admirer and you paid a lot of money to go and see him and you go there and the whole evening he's got Johnny Depp on stage <laughs> and you think wouldn't you just think this is ridiculous this is yeah. not what I came to see I think there are a lot of lapses of taste throughout the, the career and it just even in terms of the way this, the stage sort of felt and looked sometimes it wasn't it, it wasn't like a super stylish uh, yeah. classy act all the time but that was one of the yeah. things that made it like he, he did a record a couple of years ago with Bill Oddie's daughter Yes, um, yes. Oh, he was on. one of his mentors and and it was it was a bit like I don't know a bit corny or something but and you're kind of thinking well I know you're in there somewhere Jeff like <laughs> you know you, you still sound great but you do these slightly well he did talks. he made records with so many people I had absolutely no idea you mm. know um uh you know obviously it was Donovan and all that sort of stuff but Seal and Imelda May Cindy yeah. Upper. I mean he was obviously just perfectly happy to work with anybody wasn't he yeah yeah, Which yeah, is yeah. The reason I think why there were just so many wonderful tributes because he was obviously not a threat to it, to anybody. You know, he wasn't going to kind of upstage him. They all really, really loved him, and and mm. so many people had met him and worked with him because mm. there wasn't didn't be a had he been a member of a group. There's there's often that kind of sense of rivalry that you if you're in another band and you you know I don't know you just were were in competition or whatever. But everybody adored yeah. him. Yeah, and I think the competition he he played on this idea of of you know if Clapton came on stage he was sort of mime touching the hem of his garment and all that. Kind of yes. thing. But there wasn't really any competition because they'd stylistically no. departed from one another yeah, decades yeah. ago and stuff. And it was just kind of funny. But um, I did read somewhere that he was very well liked in his village and he used to spend a lot of time talking to electricians and postmen and things like that. And you'd Quite always right. know he was around because yeah, you'd, you'd see a classic car parked next yes. to the bank and you knew that Jeff was in town kind of thing. So it's very sweet. Well, like, no, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fantastic career and it's an awfully long career. But it, yeah. it's, it's it's tragic that he, you know, that he was, he was taken at, at this yeah. point, you know. Yeah. But as you say, you know, he he'd been working pretty much up to the end, hadn't he? Mm. And I so think you, I think. Sorry, go on. You <laughs> keep an eye. I like the idea of you keeping an eye on on gentlemen of the guitar of a certain age. I yeah. do because it's so because, cute and actually. But it's John McLaughlin the other day. The other day was eighty one, wasn't he, or something? And he's not playing anymore. I don't think. I mean, Is he's he done not? a couple of a couple of you know retiring tours, but I think he's just very aware of this dexterity oh, really? business. Um, I might be wrong about that, but I know he did announce stopping playing. And Matheny is a bit younger, but Matheny's still still amazing. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's not many <laughs> left now. Well, uh, with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, John McLaughlin certainly is looking very good on it. He does. He looks absolutely yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> every time I I mean, he must do yoga all whole... the time or stand on his head every morning or any yeah. pulse foods or something. I'm sure he does all those things, actually. This whole idea of them being, you know, the greatest guitarist in the world, it makes no sense when you think, well, there might be someone living in South America who we've never heard of who's, who's better than all of them. But no, it's absolutely. like, it's, in terms of that crop, there's there's very few that you well, can Well, they were, the, with, they were there when, I mean, certainly, Certainly with McLaughlin and Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and those people, they were there when it was invented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When the thing they did was invented. And they, they changed the direction it. of it. And and mm. so they will always have a kind of stature that mm. nobody nobody who came along later will, will ever had. You know, you know, it's like Louis Armstrong in the twenties or yeah. whatever, mm. you know. You invent a style and you pioneer it. The word podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. I got a question from David Burgess, Mark, and it's a topic that I think we've discussed in the past, but it's a topic that bears constant attention, can't, can't let it get away. And the question David asks is, is it the Rolling Stones or Rolling Stones? The band has, been, the so, that. band has been so inconsistent with its branding over the years, is different across album covers. Has any other band been so slapdash about its identity? I we go, we're gonna go slightly further, actually, David, because didn't we discuss the fact that when they played Hyde Park last year, they were billed on the massive great posters on the London Underground as not the Rolling Stones, not Rolling Stones. Or, or indeed but the anything, just one single word. Stones, which is, talk about wrong, wrongity wrong. That, you know, that, that is just profoundly wrong, isn't it? Because no one would go on stage, I think as we said at the time, no one would go on stage and say, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest rock and roll band in the world. Stones. Yeah, it's it's just, just it doesn't quite work. Neither, neither would they get on stage. And I mean, I do think this question of 
you know, how would you introduce a band? If you want to know how you should probably, probably present their name, imagine that you're going on stage and you're having that, let's face it, sacred duty to, to introduce people. Because I do think, side issue here, the introduction of bands is something that too many people are far too slapdash about. You know, whereas it's a it's a priestly responsibility to do this right, isn't it? Yeah, and because you've got to build to a crescendo that they merit when they come on as well. I mean, you've got to generate that excitement. You have, and you're providing. I'd even go further. I think a good live introduction is 50% of the value of the evening because a huge amount is of our, you know, emotional investment is in it starting really well. Yeah. And therefore, if you introduce them really well, you are you're aiding that, you know. So, you know, the, the point is, in in answer to your question, David, if you were going on stage in front of them to to announce them, you would say, as Sam Cutler said at Madison Square Garden in the year 1968, I think it was. The greatest rock and roll band of the world, ladies and gentlemen, the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones. There is, there is no, there's simply no other answer at all. It's the Rolling Stones. It's not any Rolling Stones. It's the Rolling Stones. That's but he, the in his defence, if you look at a lot of those album covers, you go look at Beggar's Banquet. It just says Rolling Stones, Beggar's Banquet, doesn't it? Well, so that, are they actually? Are they? <laughs> are they Rolling Stones? But you refer to them as the Rolling Stones. But the name is, it's like the Buzzcocks. Buzzcocks, the Buzzcocks are Buzzcocks. That's the name of the group. They're not yeah. the Buzzcocks. Yeah, no. You look no. them up. Whereas you talk about them as the Buzzcocks. Talking heads are called talking heads. Yeah. But everyone refers to them as the talking heads. You know, Because they made an album called The Name of This Group is Talking Heads. That's they? right. Yeah. Uh, to accentuate the point. But um, yeah, okay. But the Rolling Stones, ever since. Sam Cutler in the late 60s, he was their tour manager, and introduced them in that fashion. That's what they have been. Absolutely. It's it's the Rolling Stones, and, you know, there's no getting away from it at all. And you can't muck about with it. And also this question of abbreviating people's names on album covers is very often down to the idleness of the graphic designer given the job of doing it. Because a graphic designer, and listen, you and I have worked with loads of really good, brilliant graphic designers, but even the best of them will admit, when you get them in a pub and you buy them a few pints, they will admit that that the that the kind of uh, the, the 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 besetting you know failing of all graphic designers is they'd like to have fewer words, wouldn't they? In absolutely they everything, they, they always want make it look prettier. They want fewer it's, it's just, words and make yeah. the picture bigger. That's basically yeah. what they do. And if they had their way, they would put all type on its side, wouldn't they? Yeah. You know, because then it's easier and it's kind of out of the way. You know, yeah. And, and so the picture. that that may account for that. So anyway, David, uh, you know, I hope we've uh, set your mind at rest on that. Um, you know that, issue. that vexed <laughs> topic. You know we're we're here to help. You know if anybody wants to reach out as the as the contemporary parlance has it on on any other you know um, question that's really been bothering you of of a rocular nature or even you know. You know, as Tony Hancock said, anything else? Any aches and pains? <laughs> aches and pains. <laughs> you know, we we're here we, to help. We're here, we're here to listen. To, here to help. So, you know, we we talked to Kate earlier about uh, the sad passing of uh, of Jeff Beck, and then uh, and then subsequent to that is the is the sad passing of Lisa Marie Presley. I know, I know. Who two days beforehand was at the Golden Globes, wasn't she, with her mum? Who, of course, uh, for various fairly obvious reasons, look exactly the same age, don't they? And you can't tell which is which. And uh, they, uh, yeah, and she, that was two days before she died. And um, but that's a that's a sad old story. It's interesting the things that people pick up on. There's one theory which I, I have to say I have no time for at all, really, uh, which is that they felt that there might have been a, a, a genetic disorder in the family because her her maternal grandparents were first cousins 
Weren't they? No, sorry, Elvis's maternal grandparents were first cousins. Oh, wow. Isn't that right? <laughs> could have been. Elvis's mum's parents were first cousins, so therefore they're saying there could, there could have been a, a, a congenital heart defect because his mum died very young, Elvis's mum, and Elvis himself, but then again, and so did she, but then there were lots of other reasons for all that, weren't there? Well, I think compared to both her both her father and her grandmother, paternal grandmother, she lived to a ripe old age. <laughs> Yes, she did. No, Elvis's mum died very young. Well, in, well late thirties, early forties. Yeah, yeah. Which she was, so uh, she had, you know, was overweight, and uh, there was all sorts of the drinking involved as well. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I mean, what a what a melancholy life, you know. Oh I mean, God, it's just so peculiar. Again, reading all those obits, you're reminded of the things that happened in her life, which were just absolutely routine. There's one moment the New York Times was talking about when when Elvis realised that she'd never seen snow, yeah, so yeah. he spontaneously hired a plane and flew her to Idaho to show her some snow. There was another moment where she said she was then, awoken by an incredibly loud noise coming from my father's bedroom, which is right next to mine. When I got out of bed, I saw guys buzz sawing down his door so they could move in a grand piano. And I asked why. He said, well, he felt like playing piano and singing gospel songs. So that's the kind of thing that was going on in her household. Well, if you, you know, if you read the accounts, you, you know, she spent a lot of her early life at, at Graceland. And, you know, it is the... The most perfect illustration of that that um, very sad expression, opulent neglect, you know, that she had yeah, any, yeah. anything she wanted apart from the attention of, you know, her father. Because for the simple reason that when she was awake, he was asleep. Yeah. He slept throughout the days, you know, and, uh, and would sort of wake her up to do things, to have treats and so forth. But yeah. never once. Over the time it suited her. Never once took her to school or anything like that. No, 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 none, of that. So, n- none of that normal stuff, which is, which tends to be what most people, you know, depend on their parents for, and um, and you know, it, it's what an extraordinary sad story, you know, marrying Michael. And the marriages, Jackson, marrying Michael oh Jackson, God. four marriages, and and one of them, one of them is to Michael Jackson, and then one is one to, to Nicholas Nicholas Cage. Cage. Oh, and also she lived in England for quite a while. She, yeah. I think, fourth husband was um, based in Sussex, I think. So she lived in in some sort of nice town in in Sussex. So I can't imagine what kind of life. But the Michael but Jackson I, one was so extraordinary, wasn't it? Because at that time, you know, he had all those allegations against him, and she saw this as a kind of challenge to kind of uh, to prove his innocence. You know, and I can remember thinking at the time, are there had there ever been two more famous people? Brought together, I mean, there have been a few. There's, there's, uh, you know, there's um, Jackie Kennedy and uh, Anassis, you know, there's uh, and more recently thing people like Cherry Hall and Rupert Murdoch. But in the world at that time, you know, they were two absolutely enormous stars, weren't they? Elvis Presley's daughter and Michael Jackson. I tell you, I was looking at uh, an old clip last night of her being interviewed by David Letterman, ten years or so. Yeah, when she had a record out, didn't she? And, yeah, um, and it is. Ju- it was extraordinary to just look at her, you know, as she was as she was being interviewed, because, you know, in the, in the kind of in the the tilt of her head and the way she looked at the camera, you thought, my God, that's your father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is Elvis Presley. Yeah, yeah really. And it, it's only much. when people move that you say, you know, family resemblances. I don't know if you found this with your, you know, kids and. You know, and so forth. Uh, you only notice family resemblances in, in movement. I find, you know, it's not it's not in photographs. It's when somebody turns their head or somebody says something in a certain way. You suddenly go, "Oh my God, that's your grandfather!" You know it's I mean? speech, isn't that, it? It's Idiosyncrasies. Just, I know. It just flickers. Like you and I went to the, the 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 farewell of the great Mike Appleton, who was the producer of uh, Old Grey Whistle Test. Uh, and uh, and his brother got up and and made a speech. Yeah. His brother not only looked really like him, but had all his mannerisms, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, absolutely yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Which are also in turn back to life, and also in turn those are the mannerisms of a of a grandfather that we probably never knew. <laughs> you know I mean? Yes, that's true. All that stuff it just it just carries on, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit 
from this next bit. We've both seen the film this week, haven't we? Which is rather exciting. Very exciting. Very it's unusual. The Banshees of Inisherin, um, starring uh, Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. Brendan Gleeson. Reprising their, well, not the roles, but you know, their, their earlier two-hando, which was in Bruges, which was very good. And that's quite a few years ago, isn't it? No. And uh, this is, what is it, Martin Madonna, McDonough. Is Martin the McDonough, the guy who wrote uh, Three Billboards. And, and I, I, thought, I thought it was fantastic, actually. But I couldn't work out, I couldn't work out what the film was about. I mean, it's about two things. One is, um, is the, the, uh, men and how absolutely, male friendships and how absolutely hopeless men are in articulating what they think. Because the two of them, as you know, fall out very early on. They're trying to repair their relationship. And uh, and the other is about getting old because the um, Brendan Gleeson character suddenly decides, look, I haven't got long left in this on, on, on the on the planet, and I, I spend most of my time listening to you whittering away. <laughs> He's so funny about how boring <laughs> Colin Farrell is. He says he said the other day he said you talk for two hours about the contents of your donkey's uh, manure, <laughs> you know? and. Uh, it's just there on this remote island and absolutely nothing happens. And news is at a fantastic premium, isn't it? When they go to the only shop, you're expected to bring news of a stabbing or a death or a, <laughs> a, 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 <laughs> anything at all to cheer it's people It's got up. something in common with Craggy Island involved. Yeah, it has. Is, isn't it? <laughs> it has. Of, that dearth of, of uh, incident, you know. Yeah. <laughs> there's ever a moment that sums up the nature of, of country life. It's uh, it's uh, him and his sister who live in this little cottage, and uh, he always lets the donkey come in and kind of sit on the kitchen floor. You know, and she says, "Animals is for outside," which is just so brilliant. You know? <laughs> sort of basic fundamental rule, you know. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought it was I thought it was wonderful. Actually. I've it's, got one. Well, major... it's, it's, it's so funny. It's an incredibly funny film. It's been billed as a comedy. I think one of the awards it might be getting is as a comedy, and it is the bleakest, darkest. Comedy. It is pretty bleak, it's but it's funny, bleak. and it gets for which reasons we won't get into. It gets very, very bleak indeed at the end. But I'm going sad. to I'm going to I'm going to make one observation, which uh, coloured my entire my my whole response to this. Oh yeah, go on. Which is, I have a problem with Colin Farrell's haircut. Oh, yes. This, it's is too supposed, this is supposed to take place in the 1920s, isn't it? During the kind of, you know, the so called Irish Civil War, you know. Yeah, that's right. And, and they're on an island off the, off the coast of Ireland. Are they going to yeah. hear they, they get the guns firing in the distance kind of thing? Yeah. So it's supposed to be the 1920s. Colin Farrell has a haircut that makes him look like the art director of a smart advertising agency in London in in the 2000s. Yeah, you know, it does. It, it just does. Well it, it just looks... Or it looks well, I've, like, got a similar, I've got a similar problem with the clothes because they're, you know, they're meant to be so poor yes. that they've only got about three cows, which is his entire work appears to be herding these cows occasionally and taking some milk in to be sold, you know. And yet they all, every character turns out in the most immaculate, straight out of the catalogue knitwear. Gorgeous shirts, fabulous scarves, don't they? Incredible <laughs> coats. So true. They look really respectable. Not because a speck of dirt, not a speck of mud on them. This is so true. And it's like it's like anything. Where I, well, you and I were talking the other day about films about the First World War, you know, yeah. or even the Second World War, the same thing yeah. applies. You can't make contemporary actors look like soldiers from the Second World War or the First World War because they are too toned... Yeah. They're too tanned. They're too perfect. They have perfect teeth. They have great <laughs> they've got, haircuts. Absolutely. And yeah. and and also that you can rough up their appearance in all kinds of ways, but you never rob them of that glamour that they've got. No. That's why they're star actors, for God's yeah. sake. And I tell you, it's a bit of a similar case in this. I a similar case of this when I watched this week the second series of the White Lotus. Yeah. Which is, it's very good, and uh, and you know it's very imaginative and it's strange, and it's all kinds of you know, it's a whole assembly of characters arrive in this luxury hotel in in Sicily. Yeah, and I was saying to my wife, 
<laughs> so I got myself into a little bit of a conversational cul-de-sac with my wife over this. I said, those two girls couldn't be hookers because they're slightly too good looking to be hookers. <laughs> I, I, You're on thin I, ice here. Well, <laughs> yeah. So swiftly change the subject. You know, <laughs> I've seen hookers in hotels and they don't look like that at all, you know. Um, but anyway, the White Lotus, just one final thing on the White Lotus, which I was delighted to see or to hear. And the very last thing at the end of, the, I think, the seventh episode, it wraps up very, very quickly. And, uh, and the last bit of music that it plays out to is Sam Cooke, who we were only talking about the other week, weren't we? You know, yeah. The best singer ever. Uh, and it's Sam Cooke singing The Best Things in Life Are Free from his live Sam Cooke at the Copa. Uh, oh, that's a great record. 1964. And, and there it is at the end of this, you know, extremely hip, extremely edgy, you know, streaming TV smash from 2023. I the other thing it. you should look out for is, is Jennifer Coolidge as well. Jennifer Coolidge's speech at the Golden Globes. Have you seen that? Oh, well, I avoided that because I hadn't seen it at that point. I hadn't seen the series. And so my daughter said, don't watch Oh, right. It. You know, because I only got around to watching it this week. So She's um, hilarious. Talks about how she used to eat six pizzas a day and had a cocaine addiction and slept with dozens of toy boys. I mean, she's so fantastic. She's one of those people who's decided, I'm not going to be your standard Hollywood star. I'm just going to tell it like it is. Oh, she's really? really, really funny. She talks about her success in American Pie. Do you remember that was years ago? She said, after that, I was just... I mean, her celebrity was just massive, you know. And, uh, no, I think she's very interesting. I'd never seen American Pie. The, the only places I've really seen Jer Jennifer Coolidge is in certain films of Christopher Guest because she's in Best in Show, isn't she? She is. And, yeah. and another one. Um, I can't remember which other one. Uh, but anyway, uh, The White Lotus. She's in The Mighty Wind as well, isn't she? I think. She, yes, I'm sure yeah, she yeah. is. She's part but of she's that. wonderful. Part of that repertory company. Uh, and so, uh, I, have you noticed that there is a new boss for Radio 3? So they obviously didn't get your letter of application. No. <laughs> Chuck yours in the bin, too. <laughs> mine, yeah. mine went in the bin. And I was interested in this because they've appointed somebody not from within the BBC. Uh, they've appointed somebody who, who used to be senior at Classic FM and then was at Universal Classics and Jazz, you know. So they kind of a record industry background, if you like. And I do think it's interesting because I think all, surely all music radio services, doesn't matter what they are, they're all under threat like never before because of streaming. Because if you want to listen to music all day, you can listen to music all day without having any DJs in there at all, you know. And... Uh, and this must particularly apply to people whose uh, who's first uh, you know, uh, first love is classical music. You know that it's it's there. You can you can pull it off Spotify or or whatever. You know, even Radio Three themselves have been doing loads of kind of streaming mixers that you can play off BBC Sounds. And so, you know, the old Radio Three deal has to be coming under some kind of oh, challenge. Sure. But I mean, actually, to be fair, Radio 3 isn't quite, for people who don't listen to it, don't quite realise how much variety it already has, though. Because it's got Late Junction, it's got The Sound of the Cinema, isn't it? That film music programme. It's, it's got, got those things, it's got those things as specialist programmes, yes, undoubtedly. And it does some really interesting things. But the. Um, I looked at what it had on yesterday, and it's really interesting. And it still has those things that you remember. The Radio 3's whole thing was you had to play a symphony, you had to play all the movements, you couldn't play. Couldn't play individual tracks, as it were. You well, had to play I think the whole thing, and that's obviously changed. But I did notice that yesterday they had on the afternoon. I think they had a uh, a performance of Mendelssohn's E Minor Violin Concerto in its entirety. Okay, it's, I'm sure it's a new performance, and that's all interesting, you know. But but if you wanted to listen to that, you just it's again that's on Spotify. You you just yeah. plug it in, or you've you've got the record. You just play it when you wanted to play it. So I don't know what it is that people are looking to Radio 4 for. Well, is it? Radio, kind of, radio, well, radio 3, rather, radio for 3. some kind of... I think there's some kind duration. of... A, it, it, it's, it always feels to me like all these all these classical stations, they're trying to get the nerve up to make a leap 
from being utterly dependent on classic on the classical, you know, canon, yeah, to, to something else, yeah, and they all sit on the edge, hoping that they'd have the nerve to go over, because, and this will be particularly evident, and I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who are very aware of this, you know, and they, particularly if you spend a lot of time looking on streaming services, the amount of music that. Um, that is kind of instrumental and that is orchestral and that is kind of it's non vocal. That's the yeah. key point about it. And it's extended. The amount of it just grows all the time. You know, it comes out of movie soundtracks. It comes out of what used to be called new age music. It comes out of dance ambient. music. Yeah. Ambient. All these Electronic, things. Electronic, yeah. There is, you know, there's so much of it. And there aren't really radio stations that kind of, um, that really specialise in it, you know. And I think there's an enormous appetite for that kind of music. I think people are ro- really looking for things within that kind of sound that they can name and they can they can ask for my name kind of thing. You know? But also they're looking for it because so many more people are working at home and they want to work to yeah, music, but, but they yeah. don't want to be distracted by music with vocals. Because that's the difference. I can't work to, to anything where there's somebody singing. I just can't because the, you just feel connected. You, you feel distracted. Whereas if it's a background, so if it's just an instrumental sound, it, it's fine, you know. Yeah. So I think that's added to it. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what the new boss does. It clearly, sadly, it won't be you, Mark. But uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I was heartbroken. You can't have ever and shocked and stunned. <laughs> the word podcast: one of the few things you really need in life. So we're now joined by our uh, Patreon birthday guest, uh, Paul Knox. Hello, Paul. You're in Hong Kong. This is like three-way family favourites. This it is. is. It <laughs> is. What's the weather like there, That's right. Uh, well, in- no, yes, I'm in Hong Kong. You might remember last year when you spoke to me, I was incarcerated in a hotel quarantine. And, oh, right. Uh, that's right, you were. Was, uh, I was at the end of three weeks quarantine. Now, now that's all over and uh, we can travel and we can do what we like. So uh, things are opening up again, so it's, it's, it's all good here. So have you, good. Got any, have you got a special birthday treat uh, lined up for you? Well, um, I, I had a few celebrations at the weekend. It was my birthday on Sunday. Uh, I've actually got another dinner to go to tonight, but um, it's Chinese New Year on Sunday. So Chinese New Year is like... Christmas used to be in the UK 30 years ago. Everything closes. So um, I'm going to uh, to Kathmandu for um, for four days. To, uh, Fantastic. Nothing's happening here. And just one, one of the reasons why I chose Kathmandu, I think, subconsciously, was I don't really know if you remember, there was a Cat Stevens song on his album Mona Bone Jacon. Oh, yeah. Kathmandu. Oh, was there? And, right, go on. And I, I assumed because of that that probably at that time, some sort of late sixties, seventies, Kathmandu was kind of a, a happening place, and it a was a place where a destination. Well, it, it was the end of a hippie trail, and there is a place that's still known as Freak Street. But I assumed it was a place where artists go and, and uh, or, or stars used to, rock stars used to go. And when you go online, that seems to be the case. But then, of course, there's somebody on there that debunks the whole thing. And so no, nobody of any note went there. <laughs> and then you think, well, why, why, why would they have done? You know, I mean, Rikish, uh, Rishikesh is not too far away. But, you know, what, why would they have gone another 36 hours overland, you know, difficult terrain, difficult food and all the rest of it um, for um, to, to, to go to, to Kathmandu. So the only person that I could find that went there was Chris Jagger because Mick Jagger bailed him out of with some money at one point. Oh, right. But, uh, right. But, uh, anyway, so, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, that aside, I think it was Cat Stevens. I mean, not sure, not even Cat Stevens went to Kathmandu. Well, I suppose it's one, of the, it's one of those the places that always attracted people writing songs, wasn't it? Because it's, yeah. it's a title that's just 
kind of euphonious, isn't it? You know, exactly. Just, like exactly. Marrakesh. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, although, to be fair, Graham Nash had been to Marrakesh. Yeah, he yeah. had. When he wrote that thing with he his had. wife. Yeah. Yeah. I went to Marrakesh, and, and every third cafe is the Jimi Hendrix, you know, <laughs> thing. They just they flog it to death, because he went there, Jimi yeah. Hendrix went there for about three days, and there to Essaouira. And, uh, and that was about it. And they've just, yeah. they're still milking it, quite rightly, actually. Well, it's like well, Johnny... I understand in, in Kathmandu, there is, a, there is a nightclub called Purple Haze or something, even though Hendrix there, never, there went will, never went there. There Absolutely. will be. It's guaranteed. Yeah. So Sounds you weird. you wanted to raise the subject of the incredible string band, which is always a very easy sell with uh, with Mark. We and myself. love them. Yeah. David and I are yeah. very keen. Well, well, it was funny because I was uh, uh, there's a there's a podcast by, done by a guy called Andrew Hickey um, called uh, the History of Music through 500 Songs, and it was a labour of love for him. I don't know if you ever heard any of them, but um, no. he puts in a hell of a lot of work. And he chooses one song to describe a band or a time or a place or whatever. And a, a lot, so each episode takes about three weeks to a month to do. And then alongside that, he'll do a little shorter one for his patrons or supporters on sort of more obscure artists. So he did one on Jake Thackeray, um, Keith West, you know, people like that. And then he did a very nice one, 25 minutes on the Incredible String Band, which I think oh, the start of was... That, that it was, you know, they were a band that were of more influence than their sort of popularity. Um, but but one of the things I particularly wanted to ask you about that, Mark, was that there was a part of the Incredible String Band story, I, you know, I've listened to them all my life, but I was never aware of, which was the story of Licorice McKechnie and her kind of disappearance. Oh, yes. Uh, and, oh, and I don't story. know if you're aware that, I mean, uh, he explained it very sensitively in terms of her disappearance. But online, it's, you know, in Wikipedia page, it quotes Mark Allen from Mojo 2000. <laughs> That's saying right. That he, was, he was last seen hitchhiking across the Nevada desert. And I just thought, Arizona in, 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 desert, in, been in right. 20 years, has there been any update on that No, story? I don't think there has. No, and I'm one of the few people who's talked to Robin Williamson, one of the members of the group, about that. No. And he was very, very sad about that. You know, I mean, uh, McKechnie was his girlfriend and she was famously yeah. a member of the band, you know, along with Rose Simpson. Yeah who, interestingly enough, went on to become the mayoress of Aberystwyth because she was yeah. married to the mayor. So they both had interesting lives. But no, she just completely disappeared. He, th he said that he thought she maybe had joined some kind of cult. He was had absolutely no idea if she was still alive. I mean, it's just one of those yeah. really sad old stories, actually. She completely and utterly disappeared. It'd be so interesting because, you know, they were huge for a brief yeah. period of time. That's the and thing about them. In fact, they really were big. They're the top thing five about record, them. didn't they? Yeah, they, they? Certainly top ten, probably top five as well. Mm. If you go back and look at the charts, 1968, 69, you've got the, the soundtrack of The Sound of Music, you've got Ken Dodd, you've yeah. got The Beatles, <laughs> and you've got The Incredible String Band. Yeah. Not in an indie chart or anything like that. Yeah. In the mainstream chart. You could buy that at WH Smith's in Dewsbury. <laughs> you know, they were absolutely down the well, middle. Well, they played the Albert Hall at the absolute peak around the time of uh, of The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter. And there were members yeah. of the Beatles and the Stones in, in, the, in the audience. And, and the they made, yeah. their lab labels, they made no compromises in order to achieve that popularity. It was just absolutely extraordinary, you know, because those records were kind of... They were strange and exotic, although I still play them now, and I think they're absolutely striking. And one of the things that struck me about them, listening to them recently, is there's just nobody like them, is yeah. there? I no, mean, there's never was before, never since. Because it's traditional folk music, but it's taken off into, without being too technical about it, it's taken off into the kind of using Indian quarter-tone scales. So it's using the kind of yeah. world music format and writing 12-minute songs in four movements, you know, about the emperor of China and uh, childhood dreams and amoebas, yeah. you know. It's incredible. I interviewed Robert Plant once and he said, uh, as regards Led Zeppelin III, he said, we bought a copy of, of Hangman's Beautiful Daughter beforehand and we just followed the instructions. Which is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it was so, they were so influential. It's a really good point you made earlier. They weren't that hugely popular. They were briefly popular for a while, but, but, but their influence was enormous. And they're a classic example of one of those groups that if you like them, you like them enormously. It was so adventurous and so exotic and so different and so rarefied and poetic. And if you didn't like them, you really detested them. <laughs> you know? So. And Joe Boyd always said to me, who produced them for several of their records, said there will never be there will never be a revival. And they did try and come back. I went to see I went no, to see the no, show. Oh, did they? 
Yeah, I went to see the show with my sister. My sister had seen them at the Edinburgh Festival in about 1967 when they were inviting people on stage, uh, audience members, to play penny whistles and pipes with them. And they did the same thing in the uh, Bloomsbury mm. Theatre, I think it was. And, uh, and she went up on stage and played pipe, a pipe with the incredible reform, incredible string bands. A great moment. But uh, no, they don't but go I'd, out I'd, I'd, well, so. I'd, I'd never realised... I mean, um, it said on this podcast that Paul McCartney said that the 5,000 Spirits was the best album of 1967. And that's what yeah, he said that's in 1967. Right. And, and they said that... He said it was an influence on um, Happiness is a Warm Gun. Which, but I think even a Day in the Life was probably was that the first Beatles song that didn't have the typical form of verse and chorus. That's right, and and I think that's one of the the, the, the things that the Incredible String Band were one of the first people to do, and I, and I think that's isn't that kind of what they generally regard as opening the door to that kind of more formless type of song. Oh, that's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, structurally formless. Very adventurous. There's a specific moment, in fact, on uh, The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter, where one of the girlfriends, uh, this is, uh, in fact, Lucretia McKechnie, sings yeah. a tiny little line about amoebas in a kind of oh, childlike yes. voice. And about three or four months later, I don't know if it was a coincidence, but the Beatles do the same thing on Mungalow Bill. Y Yoko Ono was invited in to, oh, to, yes. to, to do this yeah. one little line. Yeah. Uh, about about uh, the elephants, uh, so I, I always thought there were very specific, uh, very sp specific uh, connections. Yeah. yeah. So they never led you to anything else, Paul. The Incredible String Band, because I was I was thinking I was I was reading yeah. something yesterday about the Third Ear Band, who were around about the same time, mm. and had a certain amount in common, although they weren't vocal, were they? Really, Mark? Uh, no. But. They they never never took off whatsoever, did they? Third year band, whereas Incredible String Band did. Yeah, they really did. But as you said, I don't think well, it's I mean, anybody that sounds remotely like the airport convention and people like that. Right. But not not for the same. But they were more traditional. Yeah. Folk. Yeah. 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 And one of the things that was sort of interesting about the the the, the, the female members of the band was that they didn't have strong voices, but they were very sweet voices. They were very fitting for the music. Yeah. But they weren't like a Sandy Denny or a Maddie. No, Moore. no, it wasn't. And they were really influential too. I once interviewed Robin Williamson at the Larn Festival, uh, and uh, in the audience was a girl who asked a question about about the girls, saying how they inspired her to to become a musician because she realised that amateur mm -hmm. musicians, none of those girls could really play very well, yeah. could form groups, and that was Viv Albertine of the Slits. So the Slits yeah. formed principally because well, Viv Albertine saw the string band and thought, I'm going to get a guitar and I'm going to, I'm going to form a band. Right, I don't right. have to be as good as the men, as it were. The that other, was really yeah. interesting. The other person we should tip the hat to in, in all this conversation is the man who recorded all that stuff, which is John Wood, who was the engineer... Yeah the man of sound techniques, you know, and, and John Wood could record quite weak voices or quite quiet voices. Mm. John Wood is the person who recorded Nick Drake, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and if you were going to be recorded by one person at the age of 19 in your first time in a recording studio, that was the man to do it, you know. Yes. Yeah. He, was, he was going to bring out whatever you had there. So yeah. what, I, what I suggest you should do, Paul... Is is put together a well? It, 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 nobody puts together tapes any longer. Well, but make sure when you go to Kathmandu, you've got yeah. some incredible string band to listen oh, well, to on the should. way, and and let let us know how it goes and whether you have any <laughs> any particular visions or anything like yes. that. <laughs> That's right, hallucinations. I will, I will do that. Okay, do that. fantastic. Have lovely a lovely, to talk to you. Have a lovely birthday. Very nice to talk to you. The Word Podcast. Walking the digital dog since 2007. And we're joined by uh, one of our most valued Patreon uh, guests to, to celebrate his, his birthday, Roger Millington. Roger, how are you doing? I'm Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. When, when was it? Today. Oh, it's Today? actually perfect. <laughs> oh, that's bingo. Uh, as, it, as how are you going to celebrate? You got me on the day. I was, I'm actually celebrating by rehearsing with one of my bands. So uh, oh, right. rock and roll doesn't stop. So, no, so, absolutely. What's the name of the band? band? The band is called the Avon Guard. Very nice. Ave, oh, very good. Avon Guard. Yeah, Avon Guard. Avon yeah. Was that George Harrison said? Avon oh, the Avon Gardeners. Yeah. Haven't got a clue. Haven't got a clue. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Guys, 
Where do, where do you rehearse? We're well, rehearsing in somewhere in Tottenham today. Oh, very good. Um, you know, um, I try not to go to Tottenham too often as an Arsenal supporter, as you well know. Uh, oh, oh, no. Right, okay. right, we're moving right along. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about the other night. We're moving <laughs> right <laughs> along, Mark. We're moving right that was to painful. Tottenham because we've got more important <laughs> things to things talk, to talk about. about. Yes, we have. We have. <laughs> <laughs> so it is traditional on the occasion of, of people's birthdays, of Patreon supporters, that they, they throw a log on the conversational fire, uh, raise a topic. Uh, wh- what have you got, Roger? The B-side. The B-side. Oh, right. B-side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've been thinking about it recently. The B-side is basically a thing of the past now. Absolutely. Because... Yeah, it has been for a long time. And I'm, I'm quite disappointed because... Some of my favourite recordings have been B-sides, so I, I don't mean a double A-side or an album track. It's just a standalone. It may be a, a live, a live thing, a cover version, something different, something a bit, a bit special. And so you're talking about a B-side that only appears as a B-side. It's not I, an album track because that's the no. that's the key thing, isn't it? It's the kind of yeah. it's the bonus, it's the extra. It's, thing. The, bo- it's the bonus. It's the bonus. Yeah. Although when you get CD reissues now, the B-sides tend to get thrown in. But no, something that was originally a B-side. In fact, some B-sides have been so good, they've become A-sides later on. You know, yeah. Um, how soon is now? How soon uh, is now? That's right. Even, even I Will Survive was a B-side initially. Yeah. Ma- Maggie yeah. May. Was Maggie May. The model yeah. by Kraftwerk. So, you know, I... We are the champions, I think. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. Was so, it really good? I think it might have been. I can't remember, yeah. yeah so, it says, says a lot for the standards of yeah. A&R men, doesn't it? No, no, stuff it like this. <laughs> Was initially going to be on the B side. B side, yeah. So, what's your personal favourite? My personal favourite, well, I suppose um, today, because if you ask me tomorrow, you must probably get a different answer. Today, Absolutely. I think it's um, Paris, France by Red Guitars. All right. All right. Which was a B side sort of on a reissue. So, it was almost like a bonus track on a reissue 12 inch when they reissued yeah. their first single. So, it's, you know, you have to dig really hard to find it. But I just think it's a a fabulous song. So, yeah, that, that's my favourite. So, you see, I think the key thing about the B-side was that it was like, it was like, you know, like on Christmas morning, if you got a stocking, you know, and you, you tipped out loads of things from it, and tangerine and a two and six or whatever. But if you, before you threw away the, the sock, you went down the bottom of the sock, you found a little bit of a bonus. Exactly. And that was what was the point about the yeah. B-side. Totally. It was like you'd bought it for the A-side. Yeah. And you were delighted with the A-side. But then you turned it over and, oh, there was this... this and oh, it's they... also their experimental stuff often, isn't it? It just doesn't matter if it sells. It's just something they wanted to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Three great ones by the Beatles, surely. Which never appeared on any albums, I don't think. Which is uh, this boy, yeah. Which was, I think, the B side of "I Want to Hold Your Hand." Yes, it, it is. Ticket yeah. to Ride, I think. And then yeah. uh, you know my name. Look up the lo- the number, yeah. which was the was the um, the the uh, Let It Be B side. Fantastic songs, but just done as an experiment, and that's that's, that's the end of the story. That's forgetting. I'm down. I'm Down, like, incredible. It was on the B side of Help, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm Down, which was so good, they actually finished the Shea Stadium set with it. It's the last <laughs> it's number. It's incredible. i tell you who my favourite act for B sides uh, was, uh, is the Rolling Stones of the 1960s. You put out their, their A side satisfaction and all those kind of things. were intended to be hits. They were, they were shooting for the top of the chart. But on the B side, they would put records that were deliberately not shooting for the top of the charts and there were kind of secret messages to their fans you know what i mean there were were kind of things we can't tell other people we put on the b-side of our records and there were very often stories about the kind of seamy underbelly of touring the united states in the 1960s i'm talking about songs like the under assistant west coast promotion man i can't remember what (laughs) b-side that was on and a wonderful thing that was on the b-side of satisfaction called the spider and the fly oh yeah that's a brilliant record which is about being in a hotel bar after a gig and picking up a woman not a girl a woman yeah because this, it contains the line, she was uh, sleazy, thir- uh, flirty. She looked about 30. Imagine that. She yes. looked <laughs> about 30. Right. How old was she? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would have run away, but I was on my own. You know, That's and, great. And, and, uh, and later she told me she was a machine operator. I really like the way you hold your microphone. 
It's just. <laughs> but I used to, I was sitting at home reading that you know, listening. You can still 15, remember it. Fifteen years old, and I thought that was the most exciting thing that I'd ever heard. Yeah, yeah. It was like reading Mick Jagger's diary. It was like he'd sent you a letter from on tour. Then, and the point being, it was on the B side. Therefore, it wasn't for everybody else. But because interestingly, most people, even in the glory days of seventeen singles, most people never played the B side. Yeah, the average person never played. No, it. that's true. They often didn't bother, did they? <laughs> it just didn't bother. Whereas fans did. Yes, you, you, but that's true. You're dealing with the real deep end fans. You are. The people who bought the single. So you, uh, you know, it's a very special sect, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so yes, it's sadly it's sadly gone, you know, along with all those other things that were to do with physical product and you know turning over the record. The whole nature of turning over a record is is a very exciting thing in itself, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Well, with one of my bands, with the last album we released, we, we actually sequenced it as though it was a vinyl album. So this is the end of side one, and then this is side two. It was done that way as opposed to just. 10 tracks on a CD. Wonderful. 10 tracks in a stream. So, no, this is this is how I used to listen to music, and that's how I wanted to sequence it. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. More power to you. Well, you. Uh, all, the, all the best. Uh, happy birthday. Thank that you. was brilliant, Roger. Fantastic. And, uh, Have a good time tonight. And, uh, yeah, I hope your rehearsal goes well. Okay, and enjoy the rest well. of the day. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.